What I didn't want to do is start in the 1920s or something and work my way through. What I decided to look at was the different moods that you see in childhood. Shyness, aggression, adventure, surrealism, laughter, uh, etc. I wanted to look at those moods and look in, in the movies and see where I could find those moods in the movies. Uh, usually when I'm making a film I have a timeline on the wall that starts at the beginning of the film and goes to the end. This time there was no timeline, there was this picture instead, uh, which is a, a Paul Cézanne painting. And if you look at that there's blue and there's like a salmon colour and there's green and there's like a yellowy colour. And I said to the editor of the film, that's what we're doing. We're, when we're looking at, at one of these moods in childhood, we're looking at one of these colours. So we're trying to build up a picture which isn't which isn't sort of about time, it isn't about the process of cinema through time, it's about a series of moods. And uh, I was very worried about that because there's no story, there's no road movie, and so you're relying on something else, of building up a gradual build up of a portrait instead. But one of the key things was that we wanted films from many, 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 many countries uh, because some of the best films about childhood are from parts of the world whose cinema we don't often get. So it had to be passionately international, of course. Yeah. The story of film was a history of cinema. It started at the beginning and went to the end. It was trying to be objective and to cover every country in some way. Uh, this film, the new film, A Story of Children in Film, isn't trying to be objective at all. It's not a history of children in cinema, for example. It's not a history at all. Uh, it's more like a kind of portrait of children through cinema. And that's why I said A ah, rather than the. It was important not to tell people that they were getting something comprehensive, for example. We use many film clips because it's like you want to enrich or flesh out a moment. What I can do, because I, I have a lot of films in my head and I talk to other people and kind of advise some other people, what I can do is take people, it's like saying, hop on this bus, come on a little mini guided tour, I can show you stuff and I think you'll like it, you know, and hopefully I will not be an annoying host on the trip. What I am good at, I think, is noticing connections between things. It's sort of what a poet tries to do. Um, so if you take a clip of a, of a film from one country and put it beside a clip of another country, you start to notice a connection. A, 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 like maybe a common action or a common feeling that this child in this country is doing something similar to that child in that country. And that's where you get to something like, you could call it a poetics, if you're doing, if I'm doing my job well, I get to a kind of poetics. I'm trying to sort of almost pretend that all these children are one or two children, you know, that they all line up in some way. They're all drawing from the same well of human experience or excitement about being new in the world. Or something. You're trying to notice that connection. Cinema is, a young art form that's still kind of giddy and excited with being alive, you could say. And of course children have got all this energy exploring all the time. They're always running around in an adventure some way. And I think that really reminds me of, children, of, of cinema. There's a real close connection between the two, I think. Um, what in this film, what I wasn't trying to do was show the range of cinema. There's no animation in here, for example, and there aren't many examples of an extremely structured kind of cinema where the director is clearly telling the child actor what to do. Most of the films that, that we've got in this film are more almost in the documentary area. There's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of, the child is given a lot of space to do what it does, to, in, uh, to improvise, and have fun and play. So this is a relatively narrow aspect of the stylistic range of the movies, but I think a very broad aspect of the geographical range of the movies. But crucially, it's picking up on the impetuousness of cinema and the 
capriciousness, you know that idea of caprice, that you do the first thing that comes into your head, you don't think it through too much. I think it's got the capriciousness of cinema and of childhood in it. If, if you want to show lots of the different emotions and themes in childhood, it's wrong to stick to only one country or only one continent, because the more you look around the world, you see that some national cinemas are very good at showing some aspect of childhood. So in American cinema, we get a lot of children who are little mini heroes, uh, that who are trying to change the world, or, or who are battling against the system. It's a very American idea that you know, and uh, so you get that a lot in American cinema. But in other national cinemas, you get other flavors. Uh, in Scandinavian cinema, you get a lot of children who have suffered some kind of loss, and the Scandinavian kids are dealing with that. And I think in Iranian cinema, the children are quite aggressive or extremely unsentimental. <laughs> Iranian filmmakers do, do not seem to be looking at children and going, oh, isn't that a cute little thing? They're often thinking, what a brat, <laughs> which is fantastic, you know, because of course children are brats. Um, and so that's very, very enjoyable. And it, it means that no, no one culture or no one nation has the answer to what children are. So that's why, that's another reason for spreading the net really widely, so you can learn the best about children in different national cinemas. Right. The first film I made for a feature length for cinema was the first movie, and it was based on the fact that I travelled a lot in Kurdistan, and found people in Kurdistan so much fun, a lot of laugh, a lot of vitality, and not really portrayed very well in the Western media. So my producer, Joe Parry, and I, decided to go there and make a film with the children there. We took little flip cameras and t tried to sort of test Picasso's idea that all children are creative, that you don't need to teach ch a child how to be inventive, they just are. So we brought little cameras, gave them to the kids, and then saw and just said, do what you want. If you want to just go and film your life. The first day, the children started coming back. We had only six cameras and there was a line of 20 children. The first day they came back and they gave me the footage and we looked at it. And I don't speak Kurdish, Sarani Kurdish. Uh, but I was looking at the footage and I could see this young boy about that size, 10 I think, had gone and in interviewed an old lady in the village and she was crying. And the interview was amazing. And so it really, really emboldened me to not be like the professional, knowledgeable person who is superior to, f to people who are touching the camera for the first time. I have so much to learn from children and so much to learn from amateur filmmakers and so much to learn from people who have just lived a life and have a, some, some view, some world view to, to show. I went to Albania and just asked questions. I was curious. I asked people, you know, what are the good films? Who are the good filmmakers? Who are there any great women filmmakers? And then this name, Janfisa Keiko, kept coming at me again and again. A beautiful name, Janfisa Keiko, Janfisa Keiko. And I wanted to know more about her. And somebody said, oh, there's a street named after her, like a boulevard. And you go up and there's a huge boulevard. She made films from the late 1940s through to the 70s, and loads of films about children. Um, and she was adored by the child actors and they still talk about her and there are some documentaries about where they talk about how wonderful she was. And guess what? You look in the encyclopedias of women's cinema, of com communist cinema, of Eastern Bloc cinema, no mention of her, which is shameful. We know, we know that film history has big holes in it and we know the reasons for that because it's people written by people who are sort of interested in their own world or people like themselves. But this seems to be an oversight in particular, the fact that film history hasn't really recognized this filmmaker, Jan Fisa Keiko. The film is in solidarity with Jaffa Panahi, firstly because it's my film is a little film set in a room, which you, out of which you escape through the adventures of cinema. So it's about being in a room and going around the world through cinema. So that's the first reason why it's a sort of, it's a fantasy of escape in some way, you know. So that, 
it was a reason for having it in, in solidarity with Jaffa Panahi. But Panahi, as much, if perhaps not more than anyone, has understood that a child is a kind of dynamo, a kind of wound up clock. You wind and wind and wind until the spring almost bursts, or the spring almost breaks, and then you let the child go. And little Razia in the, in the, in the white balloon, etc. She is, that's the reason why it's the most important film uh, in a story of children in film, because she has got this coiled spring energy, which is likely slowly to, you know, kinetic energy, which is slightly, sl it's likely slowly to unwind through her life. And when she's 60 or 70, she might run out of steam. Uh, and you've got this intense sense of the kinetic energy of youth. And his film captures that so well. This film, uh, Le Maman et la Bouta, is an extremely sad film about the end of 1968, the dream of optimism, of sexual liberation, etc. This guy here really messes these two women around, in my opinion. You know, it's a love triangle, and it's really honest about love and about the sort of bondage of love. It could have almost been directed by Roman Polanski. It's got the similar ideas, the triangle that's in all in so many of his films, or Knife in the Water almost, the man and the two women, or the women and the two men, etc. It's very, very Polanski, except it was made by someone, Jean Ustache, who was even more Polanski than Polanski, more bitter, more pessimistic about love. Uh, famously, he used to Somebody who knew him told me that he stubbed his cigarettes out on his girlfriend's arm. He was a very difficult man who uh, was poisoned, I think, by life and love, depressive, etc. And so it seems a very uncheery thing to have in your living room. But the film is a, a masterpiece of framing and conversations and cafe talk and sexuality and the, the, all three of them are really beautiful and so that's why it's important.